I would like to now introduce our, our final speaker for the evening, um, Sebele McConnon. Did I get it right? I'll try. <laughs> uh, Justice uh, Policy Specialist. So Sebele spent many years working as a criminal defense lawyer in Toronto, assisting clients on behalf of Legal Aid Ontario as well as in private practice. Moving from law to public policy, she recently held a position of Justice Lead and Policy Advisor for a national mental health organization. Sebele currently, currently works as a senior policy advisor Please welcome her to the stage. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. I also want to echo um, the sentiments of my fellow panelists, um, thanking uh, Tashana and Yosef for your first person um, um, accounts. And I think it is really important to hear um, these personal stories. Um, you know, we can stand here and um, talk about stats and and talk about sort of things from a professional angle, but I think it is really important to hear um, these personal stories. It's it's the best way to, to really understand what people are going through, so thank you very much. Okay. I'm also not proficient with these technological things, so I'll try to... So, um, I'm going to talk about um, mental health and the criminal justice system. That's sort of where um, I come from on this on this issue, and as Chris mentioned, I worked um, as a criminal defense lawyer uh, for many years. I don't want to age myself too much, but it was 10 years actually that I worked um, as a lawyer, and uh, I worked um, in one of the busiest courthouses, um, I believe, in the country, Old City Hall. Um, it's a very busy place um, that um, deals with drug matters as well as um, provincial matters as well. So in doing that um, role, I came across uh, many, many clients over the years, um, many of whom had mental health issues. And it's something that sort of propelled me into working in policy um, because I really, um, after working on the ground or however you want to, in the trenches we used to call it, but um, uh, working, um, you know, sort of in a client-facing position, um, I really wanted to to step back and see if I could address things from a more systemic um, level. So that's what I'm trying to do in policy now. Um, but I'll, I'll speak a bit tonight about, about um, my experience in the criminal justice system and, and sort of what I, what I saw. And I'll try to link it to some stats that I found to sort of substantiate um, what I'm talking about. So here are some facts that um, I found. These are all available online um, through Stats Canada. And um, one of the things that also Keisha touched on, actually she covered a lot of things that I think I'm going to be covering as well, so I don't want to double up on it. That's okay. <laughs> Your presentation was better, so that's okay. Um, but it all sort of flows, flows together. Um, so as she mentioned, there is a significant overrepresentation of accused persons with um, mental health disorders and substance abuse um, issues um, in custody and also in the, generally in the criminal justice system. And um, as I said, that's very much in keeping with what I witnessed, and so it's not surprising to me. Um, and the other thing that I found also is that police become default responders um, uh, to incidents that are related to mental health and addictions issues. And this may or may not be something that people realize, but that is the sort of current state of affairs, that um, police are responding to a lot of, of mental health um, issues as first responders. So, as I said, these come from Stats Canada. So, um, the following um, stats um, were part of a 2012, uh, it was called the Canadian Community Health Survey, um, and these came from the mental health component of that survey. And the purpose of this was to collect information um, on mental health status of Canadians um, and their access to mental health services and supports, including their contact with police, um, both criminal and non-criminal. So as I said, they're responding to mental health issues um, that may not be criminal in nature, but they're, they're there as first responders. I think the police are often the first, the first uh, um, sort of source that, that, that families and people will call to, to come for help. Um, so I think that is an ongoing issue, and I'll touch on it a bit later as well. And so... Um, Something interesting that I found was that yeah, one in five contacts with police involve someone with a mental health issue or a substance use disorder, and six out of ten of these people um, perceived a need for help with problems related to their emotions, mental health, or substance use. So that's significant, I think. It's that um, 
I, I'm sort of you know extrapolating, but it seems that people didn't know who else to call, so they called police. So if that speaks to maybe the lack of services available or um, even sort of in speaking about some of the issues we talked about tonight, which is um, the lack of education about what people need or about mental illness in general, um, that could be contributing to that. It's, it's not for me to say, but I think it's something to think about is sort of why, why are police being called? And so what that leads to, of course, is people entering the criminal justice system. Um, that's not to say that everyone that has contact with police will enter the system, but many do. Um, and so uh, here are some other sort of um, interesting um, facts that I came across. I found these particularly interesting because, as I said, they reflect what I witnessed while working in the courts. Um, many of the clients that I assisted fit these criteria. Um, they were often marginalized in some way. And often when I asked them about what led to uh, the current point in their lives when I was meeting them, um, they would often tell me some sort of, there were some similar stories I was hearing from, from my clients and some common denominators. Um, one was that they often left school at an early age for different reasons, but um, they often had not finished high school. Um, and they often had a fractured home life. So they left home, they were forced to leave home um, at, at a young age um, for different reasons. A, a lot of the time it was due to some sort of abuse that was happening at home, or sometimes due to substance use of a parent or a sibling or even their own substance use. And so um, early substance use and misuse was also sort of a factor. And then of course, undiagnosed or untreated mental health issues. And a lot of uh, my clients also um, were facing precarious housing or homelessness. And so often it was a combination of all of these factors. Um, sometimes, you know, one or two, but often it was, it was a combination of them. So um, that's what I noticed. And I think that the, the stats, as I said, match up with, with what I witnessed firsthand as well. So next, I'll just sort of touch on what some of the challenges in the courts are. Um, and these are some of the issues that present themselves in the criminal court system that make it more difficult, in my opinion, to help um, clients who are presenting with mental health issues. So the first point there, I realize that sort of, that came directly again from <laughs> StatsCan, but um, it's, it's not, maybe I should have uh, simplified it, but what that's referring to is, is um, decision making that, that's done at the bail stage. And so I don't want to get too deep into it. You know, I don't work for um, the Ministry of the Attorney General, and so I don't want to comment on, on, on that. But um, that, that's sort of part of the process. If someone is arrested and brought to court and is in custody, things that happen in bail court, there are lots of moving parts there. And um, there could be some aversion to releasing people. And I think that's speaking to um, the, the risk aversion in that sort of setting. And so um, if there's some reluctance to release people, um, and if that person has a serious mental health issue, that has to be dealt with as well. And so that's a very complicated situation. But again, um, that person's not going to necessarily get the help they need while they're in custody. And so it is difficult to effectively assist people um, sometimes in this traditional court setting. Um, so what has brought them before the criminal court may likely be linked to their mental health issue, but that doesn't mean that it's the best way for them to receive, receive the best results. Um, having said that, uh, this is often the first time that many people access mental health supports, and the people who operate the services um, in the courthouses are very skilled people, and um, they're very good at what they do, and they make a huge difference in many people's lives, and so I really have to sort of um, give a shout out to those people because I worked closely with them when I was doing that job and um, You know, it's not to say that people are not getting help there. They are and as I said many people that's the first time they're going to get um, Any help at all. So they may be coming from a situation where they're undiagnosed or untreated or Have never even addressed their mental health issues. So it can be positive in that sense, but um, The flip side of it is that it's not as I said the best place to sort of address all of their issues and, and there are limitations to um, how many people can get the help that they need and the extent to which they need it. 
So there's also the issue of the criminal charge that has brought them there, and that's an, ad an added challenge. Um, and that can also impact other aspects of the client's life, um, such as housing or other programs. Um, I saw many cases where um, as soon as the person was charged with a criminal offense, it you know, affected their housing situation. If they were kept in custody for a, a sort of certain period of time, um, they would be kicked out of where they were living, either due to the charge or due to the time that they were away from um, the residence or the program. And so these are sort of complicating factors that um, are very difficult to address. Once someone enters the, the criminal court system, the primary um, issue is the criminal charge. And so, as I said, there are lots of other people working around to try and help them with these other sort of external social issues and, you know, important things like housing and social services and things like that. But, um, you know, for example, and I speak for myself, of course, in, in my role as duty counsel, there's only so much we could do. You know, we were, we were often trying to make those links for them, but we were lawyers and we were supposed to just be helping them with the criminal charge. And so that was a frustration that I think my colleagues also felt was that you wanted to help them in a holistic way, but it was very difficult to do that. And so, as I said, also being in custody interrupts um, any progress that they may be making um, outside. So again, you know, attending programs or being in um, maybe assisted housing and things that were positive things, being in custody and being charged um, interrupts that and sometimes it was a, a serious setback for many people. So some of the responses trying to sort of, I guess, look on the bright side of this. Um, some of the ways that, that these issues have been addressed in the criminal justice system. Specialized courts, so that includes mental health courts, drug treatment courts, and um, mental health diversion programs. These are things that exist currently, um, many of which are very successful. Um, in my previous role, in my previous job, I was involved in a project where we um, surveyed mental health courts across the province. And um, it was a very interesting um, look at what's going on. And there's a lot going on in terms of um, creating these special mental health courts to deal specifically with people that um, have mental health issues that have entered the system. And um, they're, as I said, they're doing great work. Um, the one interesting fact that we found is that none of them were specially funded. So these courts are operating um, basically, I, I don't want to say on the side, but they're, op they're operating um, with the, the existing funds that the, the system has. And so, um, and, and a lot of the time, actually all of the time, they were started on an ad hoc basis, meaning that whoever was sort of working there and was seeing that the issues that, that courthouse had, often it was a combination of judges, uh, lawyers, mental health court workers, they would band together and say, we need to start a mental health court, and they would start it up. And so I sort of found that surprising in the sense that this is sort of just people that were interested, that saw a need, and that filled the need. And so I think that the public doesn't really know, A, that this is going on, but B, that it's not specially funded. And so this is the beginning, hopefully, of a time of you know, drawing more attention to these courts and the need for these courts and the important work that they do. And drug treatment courts are a bit sort of more rare, um, but they're also an important part of this because as, as we know, um, mental health and substance use um, are often sort of come together um, in some way. And so um, it's another sort of, I guess, solution that's, that's been found. And mental health diversion programs, that th th they're used to, as the word says, diversion, so divert people out of the system. So it's when um, people are found to, you know, the criminal charge is not probably um, in the public interest to, to sort of pursue, they find another way for the person to exit the system while helping them with their mental health issues. So there's different ways that can happen, but that's one of the existing successful programs that exists. And there are also other initiatives that are designed to help to divert people out of the system that I think over the past few years, um, the government has really tried to, to improve and increase those programs. Um, one of the newer and evolving programs um, is the use of mobile crisis response units within police services. Mm -hmm. And that was another thing that I also sort of learned about in my previous role was um, the success of those. Um, they exist in some communities, not all, but hopefully that's another thing that's sort of emerging and 
Um, and if, if everyone doesn't know what that is, I'm not sure if you do, but it's where uh, when police are called to a mental health crisis, they travel sort of in a team with um, a special um, worker, either a nurse, a mental health nurse, or a mental health court or a mental health worker, sorry, that um, can assist with the crisis rather than it being a, a justice sort of um, intervention. It's more of a health intervention, um, which, is, which is what it is. So going forward, um, I really think that um, it's important to address the root causes. Um, it's, it's really necessary um, to avoiding the criminal justice system being a point of entry for people with mental health issues to receive help. And um, as, as I sort of have here up on the screen, you know, continuing to implement and fund these progressive programs that are designed to, um, to do this. I think that's really important. And also I think data collection um, also needs to improve in order to continue to understand the various intersections such as race, gender, and socioeconomic status. A lot of the things that Keisha touched on, um, which I think she did really well, um, that is really important as well in understanding how all of those things intersect. And um, the data being collected now is really not sufficient to properly understand it. But I think, as she mentioned also, um, keep, I keep drawing from your presentation, is that we already know a lot. And so it's, it's, it's great that we already know it, but somehow sometimes it doesn't seem to, you know, push um, this agenda as, as much as we would want it to. So, you know, increased and improved data collection will always help. So um, that's all I've got. And the, the link is at the bottom. It's kind of small, but that's the stats can link if anybody wants it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sable. And I think that last point is, is very poignant that as we look for solutions and, and processes uh, to improve the mental health and addiction system, it's imperative that we involve those with lived experience and their families to help co-design those processes, because who better to know uh, what's needed than the people that, that live it every day. So thank you very much. Um, if you, uh, oh, you're ready. you got the mic all ready for me. It's fantastic. I learned from my colleagues. <laughs> In your opinion, do the police adequately understand mental health issues in the community? I know that's a broad question. Um, and is there, is there training there? And if so, what role can they play in helping the wider community understand mental health issues since they are that front line in, in many cases? I think um, I really can't speak to, you know, police generally. I think every police service has its own um, training and and level of expertise. But what I will say is that police are in a very tough position, um, not only as first responders, but as the stats indicate, they're you know, addressing um, mental health crises and things that they are not trained, and rightly so not trained to deal with. Not that they you know, shouldn't have more mental health training, of course everyone should. And I should say on that note, actually another thing that I did in my previous role as well was um, looking at within within police services their own need for mental health um, um, support they have a lot of trauma and they have a lot of um, you know mental health support that they need as well so I think it's important to think of it that way as well they're they're in a as you said they're, they're front line they're first responders that's one thing um, but um, to expect them to be mental health um, experts I think is unrealistic um, of course everyone can use more training, absolutely everybody, especially people that work with the public in any sort of front-facing um, role, which includes um, all public services, I think, you know, that everyone could stand to learn more. And as Ferdas was saying too, even in, you know, community, in, in um, our own communities, you know, that everyone needs a little bit more understanding about um, sort of some of the nuances of mental health and and reducing the stigma. So I think that's not specific to police necessarily. I think that what I didn't, what I sort of forgot to mention with the mobile crisis units um, is that even with those programs, which are great, they need to take the person somewhere. So if they're going to divert them out of the justice system and make sure that they don't take them um, to a holding cell or, you know, the next morning to court, right. they need to make sure that that person has somewhere to go in the community. And so that's a health issue. So if those services are not there, and as I think it was 
um, Ferdos mentioned about the six, or no, it was, anyway, I forget. So many good stats tonight. <laughs> but the 16 month waiting you know, period or, or, or seven months, or whatever, even seven months is a long time. So you know, people are waiting for services and back to the issue of first responders, I mean, there's no waiting time um, allowed. They have to take someone right away if they're in crisis. You can't say, well, can you hold on just like a week and then, you know, get back to us. It's like, so I think that's a really important issue that, um, you know, is tricky for some people to talk about because it's a lot of finger pointing and well, you know, but it's a health issue. And so if we have nowhere to send these people, we have, you know, these community uh, mental health providers are tapped. They are tapped to the max. They're, you know, they're working their hardest. They're serving so many different people every single day. and it's not enough you know there's the people keep coming and look at uh, the stats are going up going higher every year so that's the issue i think right. great thank you